What's going on guys? Sam Prentice here back once again making things happen and today we've got the BQ Hurricane 3D printer which is a clipperized 3D printer straight out of the box. It seems that all of a sudden clipper is a whole big thing and um, you know people aren't dragging their heels with this. Now I did actually get to see this printer at the East Coast Rep Rep Festival this weekend just gone and we did have a number of questions about it pretty much straight off the bat so I emailed uh, BQ and asked them those questions especially around about things like input shaping. I've got all the information now so let's get straight onto this unboxing. Here we go. You are watching a master at work. Are you not entertained? So BQ recently reached out to me and to what seems like another hundred or so other creators to take a look at the new Clipper Eyes Hurricane three D printer. And as I said at the start of the video, it does seem that Clipper has really found its place in recent times, speeding up many offerings from places like FL Sun and Creality with their UI pads, integrating a number of older style printers, offering up speed and quality in various forms. Now, how this offering is being distributed, well, it really remains to be seen, especially when you consider how Creality have throttled back and held back on unlocking various elements from their Sonic pad. That's certainly as of when this video was made, of course. And while I'm no Clipper expert, I do run another six printers on Clipper firmware and really do prefer the overall experience over Octopi or transporting an SD card around from my computer into the front of the printer. Now, Clipper firmware in its basic form teamed with other bolt-on elements allows you to print faster while maintaining quality. This isn't new, but since the supply of Raspberry Pis have been reduced due to the pandemic and limited chip stocks. This apparent gap in the market has led to many companies changing chips out. For example, the very popular SM32 chip has now been replaced by the alternative GD32. That being said, the SM32 chip is incredibly popular and has left many companies producing alternative microcontrollers. So when BQ reached out to me, I was well intrigued. Not just because of the Clipper integration, but also my last printer I backed on Kickstarter was the BQBX, which to be fair, well, it didn't have a long life on my printer setup. So just before we proceed any further, I did want to thank today's sponsor, PCBWay.com. If you have watched any of my recent videos, you'll know already that I hold PCBWay.com in high regard regarding of production of PCBs while they needn't be a chore, whether it's PCB prototyping, PCB assembly, flexible HDI PCBs, or even 3D printing. Well, you know what? They've even got you covered with CNC machining as well. Well, make sure the PCB weight is your first consideration when it comes to this kind of tech. Let's get back to the Hurricane and I'll speed up the video through the boring bits. So this printer is what I would describe as being a modern Ender 3 updated 3D printer. The reason being is that it shares many of the original specs such as the X and Y build volume and a single Z setup with the Z volume tapping out at an incredible 270 millimeters. Wow, that's a whopping 20 more millimeters than the Ender 3. So is this where the similarities end and the new edge tech takes over? Well, yes, sort of. So the brains inside of this particular printer and the motherboard is the new Manta board from Big Tree Tech, which is something actually I'm about to install inside of an SR Delta printer. The board is pretty impressive and nothing short of a delight being offered inside of this machine. With 32 bit and 64 megahertz, this board is also available with the CM4 and the CM8 config. This is the four along with the CB1 module, which integrates allowing the board to be piggybacked in order to run Clipper. The CB1 is a four core Core X chip with 512 meg of DDR3 three memory. I think one thing that's definitely worth pointing out is that BQ or Big Tree Tech and Clipper have been working together for some time. In fact, they're even named on the Clipper support page. So what really makes this different? Why should you even care? In fact, in the box, you'll find the usual tools and jokes ball of PLA. Also inside, you'll find the ADXL345 accelerometer board. This module basically pins to your bed and to the extruder as part of your tuning procedure to measure the frequency and ensure improving quality. I'll put a little link in the description if you want to read more about that and input shaping. On the back of the printer we do have a couple of USB connections. They can be used for things like webcams, although stock the printer doesn't actually have the setup for time lapses, but that will only be a matter of adding on in the software if you want to wake that up. The other port of course could be used to even control another printer, also using Clipper. Again, let's not get too ahead of ourselves. The SPI slot on the back again is for your ADXL module. You do not need to keep this installed other than when you calibrate. Remove and hope not to lose is basically the equation on that. We also have a handy Ethernet connection, if you don't like Wi-Fi, rated at 100 meg. So one particular feature on the Hurricane is the heated bed. And apparently it boasts a new feature that I've not seen on any printers so far. The central part is actually powered by a 100 watt heater and the external part ranges up to 240 watt in a sort of 
kind of energy saving attempt. I'm not sure about that myself, but it's an interesting feature nonetheless that might be easy to ignore. My bed actually came loose and the one that I worked on at Earth as well also needed a bit of an extra turn or two. I'd certainly suggest that all bolts are addressed on your new 3D printer. Next, one of a couple of things that you should not ignore is the bed leveling sensor. This thing shoots out like a deployment of a missile. It's aggressive, rated for more than 10 million deployments. The probe, well, might be working long after many of us are dead. Uh, the hot end assembly is actually pretty neat compact with a double part cooling fan. Also, we have RGB lights on the display and also on the hot end. So talk about reliving my youth, maybe neons under cars will make a comeback too. Who knows? In any case, I'm sure it will look stunning on the make it extremes of the future. Just to break inside here, I did see this on Chris K's stream, and while I tried to ignore what was going on due to wanting to deliver on an independent review, the wiring board information being printed on the inside of this cover is a genius idea. And long may it continue and to be copied and adapted by everybody. As I said previously, this is the Manta board. I have the larger version going into a Delta printer, and it was a little bit odd that this one was green, whereas the Big Tree Tech boards tend to be black, or certainly mostly black. So maybe this is the way of almost keeping an OEM style onto the boards. Uh, we have one cable on here that has ferrules installed where the rest are tinned. The power supply is 24 volt and although it's slim, it's generic and not a meanwhile. The install of the gantry and the Z uprights are simple enough. I didn't actually follow the instructions and kind of went in a roundabout way with this, but the results were the same though, so that's okay, right? Uh, the bottom of the Zs are basically four screws, very, very similar again to the Ender 3 pop those in and you're pretty much good to go. As you can see there, the Z-Rod uh, needed to be taken apart and reinstalled into the gantry, which I did later on. So as we're nearing the end of this install, I want to talk about noise. And in the vast realms of assuming that 3D printers are quiet, well, very few actually are. And despite the 32-bit board and silent stepper drivers in the form of TMC 2209s, the fan inside the printer, well, I can only assume that BQ got the name Hurricane from the noise of the printer it is extremely noisy the fan is on pretty much all the time that the printer's on and uh, it's certainly blowing a gale in there on the extruder we find a throwback to the end of three with a slightly updated extruder bracket which although i haven't had any clicking um it's not the best so the retraction is actually very loud and quite annoying it does however have a filament runout sensor on it which to be honest I would rather have had a better extruder and not have the filament runout sensor. At the front of the printer, we have an OS card slot, which holds your clipper programming data. This is just at the right height for your best mate, Nigel, to come around and pull it out just to see what was going on inside the printer, or in fact, my son. So I guess it is possible to have some modification to that. The MCU card slot, which was provided without a card in my case, will never be used. Sort of sad about that, really, because I have been harping on about it since the Anycubic Viper came out. And here it is with clipper, BQ, you've sort of given us too much, which now needs to be taken away. You may have also noticed that there is this weird switch that's on the bed to switch it on and off. I've got no idea why they've installed that there, but if you decide that you want to switch your bed off, well, there you go. Okay, let's hit the button and hope for no blue smoke. The little screen on the side, for me, is actually a bit of a waste of space to the right-hand side of the printer. John and I actually discussed it being relocated while we were at the East Coast Rep Rep Festival. Having used it, it doesn't fully function as it should for options like settings on the PID tune. So unless you just want to check the heat, and the time, it might be something to remove. The OS card takes around about 30 to 40 seconds to boot the very first time, and that's also when the web UI also becomes alive. Some things don't work. Never mind, and it doesn't matter. The good news is, though, of course, that we do have Clipper. And with that being the case, we are going to start input shaping and tuning. Input shaping, again, is a measurement technique that reduces ringing on the prints. This is a common defect, sort of like an echo. This is caused by the mechanics and vibrations during printing. Input shaping controls and helps towards cancelling the vibrations. There is a ton of tuning that you can do with Clipper. You might want to also see the quality, of course, before you start to do this and monitor the results yourself. PID tuning, advanced bed levelling, skew correction and pressure advance are all worth reading about, especially if you want to get your prints looking spot on every single time. The bed levelling is set to a 5x5 five five config and doesn't take too long. However, getting the bed flat inside of the mesh is something that you will want to spend a little bit of time on, mainly because you want to give the printer a chance to deliver on great prints. 
So pre-installed into Clipper are three G-code files. These are a boat, which is basically a benchy, a circle, which is kind of like a rocket, and the bed calibration tool. Again, I took some time to level up the bed and I had no issues laying down some great first layers. And so we print, and the results of the first couple of prints are, well, so-so. So I added various changes inside of the slicer, along with the calibration of pressure advance before going on to print a number of other test prints. So what I will say is I think the extruder is actually going to be a weak point on this printer, as you really need to get the pressure and the power to get the filament out of the nozzle in order to get the speed and efficiency. So right now, while recording this voiceover, I'm actually printing a Cinderwing Crystal Dragon, and the speed really felt like it was nothing special. So I upped the speed on the print to 200%, and it really felt slow when you put them up against things like the Ratrig V Minion or even the FL Sun V400. This being the case, it's really started to make me wonder that Who's this printer actually going to be marketed for? Who's going to want this? And is the speed going to be enough for somebody to really make a change from a normal Ender Marlin style printer? So I think we're on day four now of print tests and uh, calibration cubes, which uh, I've been having a lot of fun doing. Benchies, this circle thing, whatever that is. Uh, and to be honest with you, the lackluster approach to this, thinking that this was going to be a very quick printer out of the box, I'm not entirely sure if BQ were delivering on that kind of clipper speed straight out of the box. In fact, I think it's more like ender speed out of the box and then perhaps pulling people in to basically learn how to use clipper and to increase speed. And perhaps that's really their marketing decision there to slow this down in order to speed it up. And it does speed up check this out. So this is a stretch test cube uh, printing at 300 millimeters per second. So I just paused this print as you can see on the very bottom here um, we started to get some deviations around certain things like speed um, and actual extrusion here and this is when we were getting up to around about 380 millimeters per second. So um, I think we're going to have a small issue around the extruder being able to deliver the amount of output required in order to get super, super fast speeds. But certainly, um, having tested this so far, we are pretty comfortable that we can get 200 millimeters per second on this particular setup. It's rated, I believe, at about 180, but I think there is some things that we could improve on in order to push it, including, and it does already say this in the literature, perhaps the Hermit Crab, which is the, um, the BQ alternative to hot end changes, and also the um, H2 extruder as well, which is a direct drive, which may also allow this to go a little bit quicker. So, food for thought there, I'm going to be making another video on installing these on this particular machine because, hey, I didn't know what to put it on before, but now I've obviously got something much better to, uh, to try it out with. In that case, obviously, I can then put up to three different extruders onto it. I can use this particular one and I can also use these parts. I don't quite know how I'm going to put the uh, order bed leveling on it just yet, uh, as obviously this is part of that particular um, setup, but we'll uh, have a play around with that. So as far as I'm concerned, this does work as it should do. Um, although we've had a couple of issues along the way, certainly with the calibration cubes. But as soon as you've got this dialed in and as soon as you've got your super slicer set up in order to work with Clipper, and I guess, I guess you've got your head around how Clipper actually works, I think you're going to have a really good time with this printer. So I just wanted to show you this one, and this is a 30-minute chip cube. Um, it's kind of as you would expect it to be um, from, a, from a chip cube. Everything seems to be quite nice uh, the way it works here. Now, this one is a 28 minute uh, chip cube. And I'm really sorry about the light in here. Let's try and uh, maybe kill that one, see if we can. Yeah, okay, that's better. Okay, so again, this one is a 28 minute chip cube. Uh, and then I decided to kind of go a bit crazy with things here. And this one is a. Uh, nine minute and I've got a 12 minute here as well so this is the 12 minute again you start seeing you know uh, addition issues here maybe you get some separation on the layer lines and things where the extruder starts to skip and of course we are kind of maxing these things out here just to sort of try and find a you know almost like a happy medium here just to show you as well uh, this is the Anycubic uh, no, it's not. This is the Anycubic Neo, um, just in its standard form. This is running at 200%, uh, so this is probably around about half the speed that um, that we're able to achieve out of this particular one. Um, but all in all, the chip cubes that we printed here have been very good. Um, 
obviously, other than the 9 and 12 minute one, which we started seeing these deviations on, the Benchy that we um, tested and then went on to doing things with Linear Advance here, um, overall is going to help you with your... 3D printing experience. Now, these are machines. People say to me all the time, well, it doesn't work. This isn't what I expected. This is, this sucks. And unfortunately, friends, you do have to understand how the machine works and understand how the maintenance works along with actually setting these things up. Now, I'm sure within a few days, there will be somebody out there that's going to be a, giving you a super slicer profile that will make this work very, very fast. I'm going to continue to work with this printer and see what I can get out of it. And with a bit of luck, and if you're buying one of these or if you've bought one of these, it might help you out too. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is certainly not an Ender Free because we tried this using the Sonic Pad on the Ender Free. Similar kind of speeds, and well, this was the result. Um, not good stuff at all. So, at $369 on the pre order or €379 Euros on the pre order, this printer is going to be coming out in November. Is it worth the money? Yeah, I think it I think it is. I think if you're getting into this or you've had a printer before and you want to upgrade and you want something a little bit newer, maybe you want to work on some speed, maybe you want to work on clarity and defining your prints, this certainly could be the one for you. And I'm just finishing up on this crystal dragon. It's called the Infinity Dragon by Cinderwing. So thank you very much to the guys down there for sending me the file in order to print this on this printer. There is some talk, of course, about the H2 hot end perhaps being upgraded to fit onto this. And like I said before, if I manage to do that, I will put a video out. So make sure you like, follow, and subscribe. I'm just going to show you a little bit more of this Crystal Dragon. So the results are in and I'm actually pretty impressed with this. It's certainly not an end of free. It did start out slow and I was kind of a little bit concerned that actually this wasn't going to be quite the printer that perhaps it had built up to be, but it has now shown its true colors and I think there is a lot more to get out of this printer. So if you have enjoyed this video, the comments go in below. Make sure you make a comment. Make sure you chuck us a like and please hit that subscribe button because it helps the channel out very much. Um, until next time, thank you very much for watching. We'll see you again soon. Take care. Bye for now. You are watching a master at work.